Hello and welcome to Efficient Strategy Gaming. Today we're going to do a part two of my army composition guide. Uh, we had some commenters that were expecting something different from the video, so I'm just going to expand upon the video and uh, broaden the topic a little bit here. And uh, the specific question was how what uh, units work well together and synergize together. So I'll try to give you an overview of basically how a good army should operate and what divisions operate well with each other. And I'll talk to you more about my specific uh, tactics that I use with mobile warfare. So as you can see here, we're as Germany and we're ready to start up World War II. I have different divisions here in each one of my armies. And uh, let's go over a basic infantry army. So this infantry army here has mountain divisions because they're in mountains and hills. And they get a bonus uh, if, they, if they're a mountain division. You can see that right here. So that's why this army is in this particular location and built out the way it is. So you're only allowed to have so many mountain divisions in your overall forces so i have all of them here because that's the only mountains that are available uh, against poland what else do we have here i've also built out an artillery template just to get our soft attack up and i deployed it in this army just to get more soft attack then we also have some aa sprinkled in here uh, to compete with the polish air but also, after we take out Poland, we're going to go for the low countries, and we might face off against some English or French tanks. So I have these divisions specifically built out with a piercing of 16 to deal with tanks. So that's why this army is composed of these t different types of divisions. And mainly what I did here, and this is a trick that I use in all my AI playthroughs is I kept the base template for Germany the same. And that's because they have regular XP right out of the box. And that gives these divisions 25% modifier in combat. So when I made out these divisions, such as the AA division here, I utilized the duplicate button and that way, when I altered the division, it didn't alter the divisions that I received on the first turn of the game that have good regular experience. So let's take a look at Rommel over here. So Rommel needs to siege Danzig. And he mainly has the higher XP divisions here because they'll be good on the assault against Danzig. And then he also has some AA divisions, and it looks like we're going up against a fort. So the piercing of the AA divisions will be useful in this particular situation. And uh, let's go to a different type of army. And that is Guderian's here. And Guderian is the general of this Panzer army because he has Panzer Expert right out of the box quite powerful. Trickster is one of the most powerful traits on a general that you can get right out of the box. And uh, as you can see here, I have only three Panzer divisions. I did not build out more because we're thinking way ahead. We're building out our armies to think years ahead. And when we head into the Soviet Union, we're going to burn through a lot of Panzers. And I want to keep these divisions stocked full of tanks. So that's why I've only built out three here. And they're actually the three that I started with. And they have quite good experience. So I did not touch the division templates. And um, as you can see here, I built out these cavalry templates to simply trail the tank divisions. So you're going to have your armored spearhead here. And then you have the motorized division to take and hold cities. And then you have the cavalry divisions to take and hold territory behind the tanks. Oh, it looks like I did build out a fourth panzer division there. Let's take a look at our stockpile. That's because I am building quite a few tanks. So I felt comfortable to do that. 
because I have a stockpile of enough tanks, and we're going to be capturing a lot of tanks uh, from France as well. Poland does not have uh, tanks in 1939. Okay, what else can I tell you about your army composition? Well, a good army composition will have a way of getting green air over their armored spearhead. So we are using combined arms to achieve the maximal effectiveness of our army. So you can get green air several ways. You can get green air just by having fighters. All uh, fighters and CAS have a air superiority rating of one, and uh, your tactical bombers have air superiority ratings the same, I guess, but um, heavy fighters have 1.25 air, superior, air superiority rating. And I would only employ the heavy fighters if you're talking about having to deal with very large air areas like you face in Russia. But I typically use the tactical bombers in Russia that I receive in the, at the start of the game in Russia because they have the range and they can give you air superiority. But a good area to have heavy fighters would most likely be in the Pacific because you're trying to cover these very large areas over here. So either US or Japan could utilize heavy fighters more effectively. So we're using combined arms and we're building our army with one spearhead and then basic troops to hold the line and follow up the attack. And um, another trick that you always want to employ is if you have a navy and the navy is attacking a coastal area, you want to make sure to not have them on a mission here and just plop them in front of the coastal area that you're attacking. And that will give you a bombardment rating. So that is part of the army composition that will help uh, your, your ground forces do better. And um, that's basically it for specific army compositions there. You have to see what terrain you're going up against. You have to see, uh, are you attacking forts? Are you attacking into forests? Are you attacking into plains? Tanks don't do well in areas that aren't hills or plains. Uh, you don't ever want to put tanks in the mountains. You always want to utilize your mountain divisions in the mountains or hills, of course. Uh, I would only employ infantry in forested areas. And um, you always want to max out your divisions to 24 because you can get an upgrade of a very powerful trait here uh, with skilled staffer that goes into expert delegator if you build into a field marshal and basically you can get your army size up to 30 which is quite powerful because if your general is ranked up a lot you want your army to be under that general because you'll get all the bonuses from that general. So I guess another area to talk about in terms of army composition is do not ignore your general stats and then your raw stats right here, this raw number. Yes, these stats do matter, but as you can see here, um, this trait of the general um, is going to give you some buffs. Let's see here, right here is where it should say. Skill 4. Having a higher skill than the enemy general gives the leader an extra chance to pick a counter tactic to beat the enemy. That is very powerful. So if your general is 5 and your opponent is 4, it's more likely that your general will pick a counter tactic, which is very powerful. So even if your general has a better attack skill or whatever type of rating that you want here, um, having a raw skill level that's higher is better in most cases. And you want to choose generals based on your overall uh, technology that you're, you're going for as well. So for grand battle plan, you might want to have generals with higher defense, 
for mobile warfare, you want to have generals with higher offense. Superior firepower, a balance of both would be really, really good. And obviously, your army composition has to be built out to synergize with your doctrine. And I have found that researching a doctrine early is best in almost all cases. And you definitely want your army composition to follow what doctrine type that you're using. And I have videos on that. Uh, if you want to look that up, you can go ahead and, and look up that type of video. Uh, but yeah, you want your generals, your individual armies, and uh, your overall battle plan, and um, what type of land doctrine you're using to all synergize together. And you have to think about this turn one, what you're going to do, because if you accidentally go down the, the wrong land doctrine, it's going to have a lot of downstream effects. Even how you build out your experts here, your military staff matters quite a bit. I'm using an armored spearhead, so Rommel is very powerful for me. Uh, and then also Guderian buffs the armor max speed to 10%. So I chose these specifically because we're going to get victory through that armored spearhead and drawing encirclements around the enemy. Now, if I didn't want to do that with Germany, if I didn't want to use the armored spearhead strategy, I think that Udet here is quite powerful. You could go for an air superiority, Cass uh, kind of wear down the enemy through the air build, and uh, you could get a ground attack with your Cass, a plus 10%, and Udet could be quite powerful, but you'd be going away from using tanks altogether probably. Uh, you probably wouldn't produce tanks whatsoever if you employed that type of strategy. So the type of strategy you use needs to synergize with the, the forces on the ground. So that's basically it. If you have any other questions, please leave them below and I'll try to answer uh, whatever questions you have. I hope that this uh, complements my last video on army composition and maybe answers a few other questions that you guys had. Uh, thanks for uh, watching the video, guys. Please leave a like and subscribe if you enjoy this type of content, and I'll see you on the next one.